We heard on Radio Newcastle the trust was being set up. It would be called the North East Maritime Trust and they wanted any volunteers. So myself and a pal of mine, Brian, we came down and we volunteered. We believed in what the trust was trying to do, which is to preserve the examples of the wooden boats that were used on, on the coast here. The boat we're busy with at the moment, the Henry Frederick Swan, which is the old Tynemouth lifeboat, was built in 1917 by Saunders on the Isle of Wight. And then it came into service again, came into service rather, on 1918 until 1939. Mainly, I, was, I had finished my time, so I was fireman, deckhand and fireman. And eventually, I was relief engineer in a big tool called the Tyne Cider. And that's the one that Duncan was in. And about four o'clock in the morning, we'd been doing a job and we're coming back to the boys to tie up. We used, and used to tie up the next to another tug. It was the boys' job, the, the, the lads' job, to jump from your tug onto the other tug and put on the ropes. Of course, we were leaving the standard boys, and of course, Duncan being the boy, he had to jump aboard the other tug. We're coming alongside this tug, and I'm going to jump from this tug to that tug. Because when you threw off, the tug started to go off like that a bit. And I jumped, and we said, and we. And, and my self-conscious says, you've jumped too soon. <laughs> and he tried to jump over and he, he missed and he went in. In the water, in the drink, and I'm swimming about in the water. He could have just pulled it right out. Eventually, after a long struggle, the pullers aboard the tug. Took a bit of pulling it more than me. I was a big lad, I'm still a big lad. He was, he was 18 stone then. When tragedy happens, things change, don't they? And um, my husband died at, he was 34, which was very tragic, and we had this idea of trying to raise money for the hospital where he was. He spent six weeks in uh, the ward, uh, just to buy something for the ward, actually, and um, we just raised money and then we raised more money, and we decided why not take it more seriously and raise money for cancer research, and we just got better and better. We worked full time, we had families, but we concentrated on working for cancer research. But we didn't think we would make as much as we did. Uh, fear that we were doing something important to raise money for cancer research. Yes, I used to love doing um, No More Tears with Hilda. Um, wall in black and, you know, messy, obviously. You weren't, we, we, never, we, we never pretended to be glamorous in all my silver chains and everything, and then we used to strip off halfway through. I think if our contribution helped, I don't know, extend maybe one person, or made one person's life a little easier, well, that was, that's what it was all about. You know, now, when I think about all the improvements in cancer care, uh, due to cancer research, we really like to think that perhaps we did something towards that. I was born in Whitburn, just over the ridge there, and uh, I've been coming here all my life. Um, I used to be really into drawing when I was a kid, and I used to come up here sketching and bird watching, and, and it's inspired a lot of my, um, my writing, my poetry. They weren't going down with any, any kind of begging bowl. And that was all they were marching for. They wanted to give themselves and their families dignity. They wanted to feed their kids. It was my grandfather, Luke McCauley. 
He would have been uh, 33 year old when he went on the Gerald March. They wanted a right to a decent job. They weren't asking for anything free. They wanted employment, but paid employment to feed their families. And he sketched out the letters Gerald Crusade on them. And they were used as a template for the actual banners. school and the teachers were trying to persuade everybody to put their name down to go on evacuation but I didn't want to go leave my mum I was the only daughter just had a brother and uh, but my friends were all going so I said oh yes I'll go we gave, they gave her a week to get with the give her a list which my mother had a job getting because you had to use coupons and I had to have new pyjamas, new jumper, skirts, shoes, wellies, slippers, and the case had to be full. A plane, near the end of, near the, end of the old clear, a plane flew very old close overhead, on fire. It crashed at the right hand side at the bottom of Beach Road and it blew up. Killed the firemen, killed the airmen, blew down the um, the, the building that houses the little boats, the little yachts, and um, just created mayhem. If you could grapple in the lake with bent coat hangers and pull something out with a, a German writing on, this was this was a swappable article. And I pulled out a flying boot. I've got a flying boot, I shouted. So they all came running along. Hey, that's great. Let's have work. And then. I put my hand inside the flying book, hand, I point out, and pulled out what appeared to be cooked tripe, this wobbling, jellified, whitey, creamy skin. And of course, it was the poor man's boot, it was his foot that had been blown off. Well, Slake Towers, Slake Towers was one of the busy roads at the, edge, at the edge of Tyne Dock. Um, actually it was f full of uh, public houses. Uh, that, I think that was its mainstay. The, the best place where we used to get a good laugh when we were boys was um, a, a cafe which was called the Cafe Noge. And it was supposedly um, a place of ill repute. Now if you carried on up Hudson Street, you came to another boarded out house, the uh, shop, sorry, and then you came to this other place where all these ladies used to live, they, they, masses of them. Now, my sister Sheila and me, we used to keep getting pennies off them. They were a lovely set of lasses, uh, from what we can remember. So we used to sit on the step at the bottom of the flat, and there were some ladies who used to come past and speak, always very nice, give us sixpence each. Every Friday night they gave us sixpence for him, sixpence for me. A really nice set of women, they always were kind, always sweet women, but of course what it was, it was, it was a brothel. I was talking to my mum about it, and she suddenly told me, these ladies were prostitutes. They were there to serve us, to sit the seamen. Because I didn't know what they were. I mean, they're just nice ladies, give me sixpence. And I says, you, you let them? She says, well, I thought, yeah, in the dock area, a lot of sailors, a lot of bad men around. If those ladies knew you, you weren't going to get harmed. They would make sure you were safe. And she was right. But of course you had them in the pub and in the brothel and just up Dock Street, immediately up Dock Street, the, one of the first buildings was the spiritualist. That was a big meeting place on a Saturday night particularly. That was quite good fun as well because they used to faint and pass out with all these messages they were getting and they used to pick them up, bring them out and lay them in the street and just leave them on the pavement and leave them till they come round. So you had the spiritualists as well. I'm saying so. You had you had a right mixture. You had the ones doing, you know, you know, you know, the, 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 being talking to the dead and glory to God on high. And the other ones who were busy stinging of the other sort of spirits and beer. And then they had the other ones who were busy looking after more than the spiritual welfare on the corner of the brothel. Um, it was a and it was it was quite a place to be actually. There's various theories as to what a skatender is. One of them is that if you look down on the area from above, it's in the law is in the shape of a skate. But probably the most reliable one is that um, this was the end of the river where the original fishing 
huts were, the original fishing shields from which South Shields takes its name, and it's where they would salt the fish. And skirt is an old word for to salt. So if you were born at this end of the river, you were a skirt ender, or it's become skirt ender over the years. I was born in in um, hospital at um, the Horton Hospital, and I brought out and I spent the rest of my life under the low top, and I've never moved anywhere else. I, I've always lived here. Well, I've always lived on the low top. I was born on the low top um, at Trajan Avenue, so I'm a skit ender, uh, born and bred. A skit ender, a skit ender is someone that's lived in this locality within a certain distance from the sort of river, and yes, I've always been one of them. Not so much as Duncan Stevenson, because he's a proper skit ender. A uh, uh, skit ender, you've got to have a ring round your bottom end where you sat on the bucket when you were a kid. And I love the community that I live in, it's great. Fantastic neighbours, nice people. It's a very nice place to live, I'd live nowhere else. I just love living on this low top, I've always lived up here and uh, the house is a bit big nowadays for a pair of us, but I just don't know where else I would go in the town. This is the only place to live. It's like a little village. It's got its own unique identity and everybody knows everybody else. Um, yeah, I think it's a fabulous area to live. I can't imagine living anywhere else, to be perfectly honest. Should I kick off with that or will you? Can then you can start off, Jack, and I'll pull you up when you're telling lies. Okay. Club in Darlington, right? Gets in there five nights. On the last night, now bear in mind, the bloke who owned the place, he'd put a glass stage on. Were lights coming up, you know? So. I remember it. Yeah? I remember it. <laughs> So anyway, on with, and he asked the bloke in charge, Tony says, hey, can I put this piano on fire? And the bloke says, I mean, no, no, he says, the roadie will come on and put a sprinkling of petrol on, you know, uh, lighter oil. He says, well, if I were on call, we'll do great balls of fire. So he says, goodness gracious, great, psh, like that, with the lighter. And the keyboard would... Go up, but I says he'd be right next to him with the bloody fire extinguisher. You see? Well, he put the whole bloody tin on it. You see, on this piano. So, anyway, it's a blaze. They're all killing themselves on the bloody audience, the thick part of the show. So, they are standing like Teddy's. His fingers are all on fire. So, I shoved the piano like that to try and put it out. It went straight through his new glass stage. Polystyrene tiles up behind there are oh, bloody. The curtains are a bloody light and everything. Bear in mind, we'd been there five nights. When all the flames were put out and gone, you should have seen the state of that stage. He says, Well, you're the man for the money, kid. Go and get paid. <laughs> I remember. That's all went. Bust the I said, Who do I say to get paid? Paid? Are you stupid? It just cost ten thousand pounds worth of damage here. <laughs> right, this house will be fifty, uh, twenty pounds for the line, fifty-five pounds for the full house. Three and seven, thirty-seven, six and eight, sixty-eight, one and two, twelve. All the threes, thirty.